Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so this is work. Okay, it's complicated. Okay, <laughs> get over it. Okay. <laughs> uh, Fabio uh, Viola is a PhD student at Cambridge, uh, supervised by Roberto Cipolla and by me. And um, we decided to solve a problem that I'll show you at the very end, uh, which turned out to need, require us to do uh, a lot of work. What class of problems am I looking at? I'm looking at early vision problems, as Peter uh, enumerated to begin with. Uh, so I might want to take a noisy image and return a clean image, or I might want to take a low resolution image, like the one on the left, and return a high resolution image, uh, like the one on the right. This is an output uh, from the thing I shall describe. Um, and in general, I may want to take some bag of pixels that I've got out here, uh, some bag of measurements of the world, and return some representation of the world, and I'm giving you a hint here that there is going to be a triangle mesh, and that this is going to be sensible to have tried to extract a triangle mesh from an image, that it's going to be deeply sensible. Um, but before I tell you that, uh, let me tell you what our options are today. Uh, effectively, you may consider two schools uh, of approach to this problem. You may consider the uh, so-called discrete MRF school, where I'm given a little bag of pixels, yes, and I measure, I have some representation UI. For example, a gray level image, I'm going to find the gray level denoised value at every pixel I. So I want to find the UIs that match the image, and maybe I want there to be not too much difference between adjacent UIs. That might be the very simplest thing I think about. I use these sort of silly norms to mean some distance, don't worry about it. So that's, what, that's one side of what I might want to do. On the other side, I might want to write down this thing uh, with integrals, which says I want a continuous function u to match my image, and I want, again, to minimize some uh, continuous regularizer like the norm of the gradient. Don't worry about discontinuities for a moment. They're very important, but I'll bring them in later. Okay, and I'm going to say, well, that's a very simple. I'm not just going to look at pairs. Uh, I could have some general regularizer or prior on, on my u's. Uh, maybe my latent representation of U's is not the same size as the image, so I have some filter banks operating on the U's that give me my image. Uh, maybe I go down here and I have a sort of fields of experts model where I have a general transformation from my U space to the image, and then some general uh, representation of my prior as, as some filters applied to the U's. Uh, or I can go over here to uh, functional land and have some generalized regularizer uh, over here on the function U. Okay, so there are, those are all my options. So let me say why, how you might want to try and choose between two. And there's a sort of a classic picture here um, from Claude Adal, which um, it, think of it purely as an illustration. The idea is something like when your priors live on the pixels, they end up a little bit axis aligned. So you might end up with some uh, solutions which look a bit blocky. That's the kind of the very coarse level reason you might not want to use a discrete uh, functional. Um, whereas over here in uh, continuous land, this prior is rotationally invariant, right? If I rotate my X space, this prior doesn't change its value. So this looks good, and you might want to get a picture out, which then says, oh, look, I got a sort of a smoother solution. But there's a little problem uh, with this side, uh, which is you don't have access to this. That is not what you were given. You were given these guys, okay? So in this example, there's, there's no data term, right? Sorry, where? Oh, yes, sorry. Yes, this example is just a picture that rotationally invariant would be nice. Um, yeah, but it's an in-painting or uh, filling it. There is some data at the boundaries. At the boundaries. Yeah. Okay, so again, so I want to use this one because, you know, rotationally invariant is very nice, um, but this is the one that we know to work, right? So I've said this is a picture of fields of experts. It's not a picture of what, uh, what Levin and Nadler did, but the idea is that when you make your prior by learning patches from the world, if you take you know, eight by eight patches or 10 by 10 patches, then you can get uh, fantastic denoising results, for example. So patch priors really work. They're really great. Uh, I love them for a long time. And yet the best you can do with total variation is a kind of a cartoony piecewise constant um, uh, solution. So that seems a bit sad. The patch priors we feel capture texture, they capture important stuff about the world that the 
dead leaves model under total variation uh, can't really capture. So patch priors are great, but surely we can't be happy with patch priors, and especially think f 5 by 5 right? So I've got 5 by 5 block, and I want to use this somehow to represent something intrinsic about the way images are formed, right? Am I really going to take the 5 by 5 blocks from all the images in the universe, including all the noisy, crappy iPhone images, which are, so, are noisier than the examples we want to denoise in the first place? That's fine. That's just one question. Think about your patch prior. It's going to be rotationally invariant if you show it all the images ever. It's going to be translationally invariant. The kind of textures you're going to see in 5x5 five five are going to be on, off, on, off. Okay? There's just that not much complicated stuff happening under a patch prior. Surely we don't need to use patch priors um, to solve our early vision problems. Notice I'm restricting to the sort of 5x5 five five level. I'm not talking about 256 by 256 If you have access to all the beautiful 256 by 256 patches in the world, of course you'll do better. But, but we don't and we won't. Right? Okay, so discrete MRFs, the kind of things that I'm going to say underlie or live near patch priors, they're fine, but you, know, you might have a sort of a gut feeling that there's a continuous world that you prefer to look at. Um, but we definitely don't want to look at variational methods as they're represented today, because we don't even have access to the input data, which was that continuous image, I of X. And having drawn this distinction, um, I have yet to find a case where the variational method once you read the sentence that says, and then we discretize, and then you do lots of hard work, turns out to be exactly the same as the, as the continuous method. Right? So for all the variational methods that we know of, we have some constructions under our framework that yield exactly uh, the continuous methods. Slightly weird constructions, but they're, they're, they're the same. OK, so what is this framework that I'm, I'm trying to tell you about? Um, so. Again, here's my input. My input is a set of samples. At these pixels, I have three samples. At these pixels, I have zero samples. And at these locations, I have one sample. So the input is a set of samples, and they're scalars, even for a color image, because there are just three at the same spatial location. So sample spatial location. And in this image, I have, uh, I'm telling you, 7,000 numbers. That's what, I'm in, that's what I'm giving in. And what I want to get out is something more beautiful than what I've been given. Okay. Um, these samples, uh, there's a bunch of other stuff that I might not know about the image, uh, the blur kernel or point spread function. Um, maybe I don't know the spectral filters that gave rise to, uh, to the color samples. Uh, maybe I don't know the, the camera response function or the gamma curve. You know, you know. For the moment, let's just say I'm going to simplify it to a gray level image. So I have a list of samples and uh, I have a point spread function which I may or may not know. Okay, how did this sample get here? Well, I'm going to say that sample got here by looking at a continuous world, u of x, so u is a function mapping from R2 to the reals, continuous world out here, viewed through a point spread function, which is a kernel kappa i, and I'm representing it with this, uh, this cone here. Uh, the world was integrated, dotted with the point spread function. I added a little bit of noise, and that gave me the sample at that point. Right? So that's what happened. So now it's very easy and obvious how you write down the, the functional that you want to minimize, right? Each of my n discrete samples was explained by taking my continuous domain function, multiplying it by some point spread function. It doesn't matter if it's the same translated at every pixel or if it's a different one at every pixel. Uh, and then, and then um, I want to minimize the difference between my sample and the prediction under the model. And I'll, I've done some prior here. This is still a rotationally invariant prior. Funny norm means I may be using one norm, two norm, 0.7 norm. Um, I'll be doing something at boundaries to make it all kosher. But effectively, I'm minimizing over a continuous function u the difference between its dots with the point spread function to give the discrete image samples. Right? So that's all, all, I'm claim, all I'm doing. And I'm claiming that we have never actually, um, in computer vision, written down this, paper, this uh, to me, self-evidently correct formulation before. Lots of special cases of it. Um, um, which I, you know, I'll give you a hint as to why we haven't done it before. Obviously, this regularizer could be changed for anything. Um, you know, we'll talk about that. So what are the components here that I'm claiming we haven't properly written down before? I'm claiming we haven't properly put a discrete sum, then a norm, with the integral inside the norm. Okay? And I'm claiming that to do so would be correct. Um, there are lots of people who use special cases, like a delta point spread function. That's really no good because uh, the pixels do have a physical size given by their point spread function, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So claim two, I'm going to try and claim that having written it down, it is correct. <laughs> and the, 
argument I'm going to try to, first of all, um, um, uh, make is that uh, we do indeed have a continuous world, that it is sensible to talk about a continuous world, and that's a sensible thing to seek. Um, so uh, here is a, uh, I'm going to look at a single edge from a well-known image. Uh, I've left this down here so you can continue to study it because I hate it when the equation goes past and you don't get to see it. Um, but the top half of the slides is what we're going to look at. So I have this single edge from a well-known image. And here in red are the samples from that edge. Okay? So, even at the, so this is the sharpest edge in the image. And even those Lena's hat probably has some like furry bits around the edge. My point is that the image of Lena's hat, that sharp edge subtends maybe two and a half pixels. So if I try to reconstruct that using uh, some piecewise constant model, I can't find a good place to position my piecewise constant model because it's not a good model of what happened. However, if the black curve is now considered to be the curve out in the world and it's convolved with the green point spread function, then what we end up with is this sloping uh, reconstruction. So what I'm claiming is a good fit to Lena's hat is a piecewise constant continuous world convolved with a point spread function, and that will fit better. This one, I mean, the foreground background, the PSFs are, could be different. Yes, very good point. Yeah, yeah. And you actually yeah. can see behind the object. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. I'm making, I am making an assumption, which is that I have a continuous world just outside the camera, and that then the blurring is done on that. And, of course, that's, that's assuming infinite depth of field. And I may have an example at the end. We, Fabio certainly has an example in his thesis where he actually solves for different points spread functions uh, as a function of depth. And yeah, yeah. There's some horrible, potentially horrible differences. Okay, with the, good. Um, with the defocused background and a focused foreground, as you often have, the point spread functions don't add, actually add up to one. No. You theoretically, should get a little halo of brightness. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen them. Uh, no, we've never. We've uh, looked at um, making them live in a piecewise, you know, constant world. Yeah. So, but that's a full 3D reconstruction. That's great. That may be where we have to go. Um, Yeah. Uh, um, the, you, you, what you're having to do is take your little blue thing and do inference that says, well, actually, here is this infinite set of frequency components. And the regularizer better make sure that they behave themselves. How do you do that? Because there's a long literature running back to at least the 80s and vision that says unspooling things, which is what you're doing, is not a particularly good idea because the regularizer better behave themselves. So, uh, the regularizer, in some sense, just sits there. It's fine, right? It's a total variation well, style. Right yes. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so, the most important thing. Okay. How to word it? Um, so we do get ringing sometimes, um, as you will with any deep blurring if you have the wrong point spread function. So if we have a roughly right point spread function, we don't get ringing. Um, this is one where I think, can you ask that again at the end? Because I think when you've seen the mechanics, it yeah, might explain it. You, you said to me you can reconstruct infinite frequencies as long as you know the point spread function is exactly right. Because my representation has infinite frequencies in it from the beginning. Because you move the element. Because it's piecewise um, <coughs> smooth. So the representation. Uh, as you will see, yeah. yeah, it contains infinite frequencies. It's not bothered. Uh, right. Okay, so now I'm going to make a claim. This simple total variation prior applied to a continuous world is as good as uh, a complicated patch prior. And it's going to be sort of obviously true, but let's look at this 1D example. So the blue curve is some draw from a dead leaves model. Okay, so it's sort of piecewise smooth. It looks piecewise constant, but looks as a tiny drift here. So some draw from a piecewise smooth world. Um, that world was convolved with a point spread function giving these ideal samples. This is the, uh, the ground truth for denoising the image which I've got, which is the third row here. So this is the image I've got, and I would like to denoise the image. Strategy one I might try is a total variation denoise on my input samples. And as you can see, I get this sort of stepping uh, effect. Right? I can't, the, the prior is trying to say piecewise step edge, and of course it isn't piecewise step edge. 
So I either get a stepping effect or I turn it up so much that I'm just going to get total cartooning. Um, okay. So I think, mm, okay, the world is more complicated than I thought. I'll learn a fields of experts prior on this model. And then a fields of experts prior of size five, yes, it's beginning to understand it. Fields of experts prior of size nine can suddenly see that no, the world isn't just a simple uh, dead leaves piecewise constant model. It's dead leaves viewed through a point spread function. So the fields of experts prior can learn that and can give me a good answer. Okay. But hey, that's like a nine wide fields of experts prior on this really simple domain. Right? We might need a nine by nine fields of experts on the images, and we know it's going to be difficult. And anyway, what if I change the scale of everything? Um, so, and uh, just to show you the obvious thing, when we run the correct model, in this case, it's trivially going to work because it really is the correct model. Um, you know, I get the same uh, uh, PSNR as I did with fields of experts. Um, you know, it's sort of obvious that the simpler prior viewed through a PSF can do the same job as, as, as a patch prior uh, on this, at this stage. Okay, what's my time? Ten minutes. Okay. So, how am I going to solve this? I'm specifically telling you that I'm going to solve for the function u, and it's going to be over a sort of infinite resolution. Okay, it's not infinite resolution, it's a 64,000th of a pixel, but I think that'll do. So, what are the options? Well, okay, I claim this hasn't been written down, but we've been doing this forever in computer vision, so what do people do? A very simple thing to do is to write down the function u in terms of uh, some basis functions phi. So I'm going to say the definition of u <coughs> at a point x depends on parameters, bold u, and those parameters are linear combinations of basis functions phi. Okay? I pop that definition of u into my integral down here. I move some things around, move some other things around, move some other things around. <laughs> That was easy. Um, and now I've got the unknown parameters out here. And in here, I've just got an integral which is point spread function times basis function. Okay, so for fixed pixels, fixed basis functions, fix everything, uh, I can evaluate this integral in here. And I'm just going to end up with something exactly like the discrete MRF model that I had before. Okay, so that's, that's fine. All I've done is made myself feel a little bit better about using a discrete MRF. Okay, so that was that uh, sequence of stuff happening there again. Uh, you know, basis functions equals easy. The problem is that the fixed basis functions are not going to allow me to move boundaries in the way that will make the prior work. So that's going to, that won't do. Uh, just to remind us of things that this could mean, uh, one of the basis functions that people very commonly use is uh, what I call piecewise boxes. So every pixel has a little box. Uh, uh, the basis, the ith basis function is simply a, a one by one pixel box around the center of each pixel. And now a linear combination of these exactly gives you the old MRF. Um, some people can do uh, much more uh, interesting things. So the problem with piecewise boxes is that the only discontinuity boundaries you ever see are aligned with the, the pixel grid, absolutely not rotationally invariant. So uh, you can do better. You can use boxes which have a few more angles in them. And this gives you some increased uh, rotation invariance. But um, as ha it has only been done before with fixed uh, layout of the boxes. So you improve the number of angles you represent. You certainly don't have a continuous domain uh, representation. And you know, if I want to get uh, from, you know, if I want to get an edge that isn't in here, then I, you know, it's, it's difficult. Uh, I could do some bilinear interpolation. One sees that a lot in image vectorization. So there's a uh, in computer graphics, sometimes you have an image I of X, and you'd like to find some simpler form of it. So you can find a representation in terms of piecewise boxes. Um, I'm going to generally call this lot a sort of a wave litty expansion. So I have some linear combination of some basis functions, which might look like this. All of these are un unsuitable for my task because they don't allow sharp edges, and the sharp edges are the key to the prior. OK, so there's my wavelets again. So what do I do? I take the wavelets and then dot them with some triangles. So the triangles have hard boundaries, right? The triangles are arranged here so that they're a mesh over the image. And then I can create functions which are like um, triangles times ways that they have hard boundaries and they're smooth in the middle. Okay. So stop for a second. Right. So u is a sum over triangles, a sum over bases of uh, some parameter times the cutout mask uh, for the triangle, chi t, times the basis function. What's good about this? Well, obviously, I can represent any function because I can just let my triangles refine to infinity. I can move the vertices around, right? And, you know, providing I have suitable basis functions. 
and I'll tell you about the choice of those later. Um, obviously, I don't want to refine to infinity. I want the thing to just give me a solution. So let's see how we do. Okay. So once more, let me take you through what's going to happen. This is a 3 by 3 pixel image. I have a fixed triangulation underneath represented by the uh, blue curves. And what I want to show you is, that, is how we uh, work out those integrals. The point spread function for pixel 1 is, in this, uh, is 1 inside this polygon and 0 outside. Now you might say, that's a terrible point spread function. Uh, I want a Gaussian. Uh, I encourage you to actually look at the point spread functions of real cameras. And you will notice that they are as non-Gaussian as they are non-polygon. Right? So one of the things that you see in point spread functions uh, is the image of the iris of the camera. So in fact, a polygon may in some cases be a better model for the point. A, po a polygon with a one inside and a zero outside may be a better model for the point spread function than some Gaussian that you made up. So, so uh, I'm going to assert that I'm perfectly fine to use a point spread function which is one inside the polygon, zero outside. So my integral over the whole U is going to be the intersection of this polygon with um, the various triangles underneath. So polygon clipping routine is one of the pieces of code I need to solve this problem. Once I've done that, it's easy. I can solve for you trivially, except that it's really, really important that I'm going to move the vertices. So now what I need to work out, so here's one of these integrals, right? It's the integral of a basis function over a triangle intersected with a point spread function's uh, support window. Okay, so that's an integral of some function over the intersection of these two polygons. And what I want to know is uh, what's going to happen when I move this vertex that way. Okay, it's a bit painful to work out, but it's no more complicated than the polygon intersection. And we've written the code for you, and it exists online. So the question is, what is the derivative of this intersection with respect to the movement of this vertex? You just do some Green's theorem along the boundaries. The vertex move. These intersection points move a little bit. You add them up, it's fine. OK, right. So I've told you that we can optimize the triangle mesh, and we can move the polygons. Let me tell you for a second what the prior looks like. I wrote down the prior like this, which was just some norm of the uh, gradient uh, integrated over the domain. Obviously, that does, you can't do that where there's a discontinuity. So you separate the domain into the smooth bits and the non-smooth bits in a mumford shah uh, type way, and then you have a different regularizer along the boundaries, which says match up along the boundaries, uh, and the normal regularizer inside here. Doesn't the polygon have variable scale to be at all realistic? You know, because uh, unless you're just looking at a front of parallel plane, the polygon scales the distance. The polygons, um, you, c you should think of them as much smaller than a pixel. Does that so answer? So there's, there's one. You need an extra hidden variable, which is uh, the, uh, okay. So to answer this question about depth of field, yeah. the answer is you should really be fitting a full 3D model, right? a full 3D model of the world, which you may represent as piecewise uh, chunks at different depths. Okay? So to do that, I've got a chunk here at the front and a chunk at the back. They will definitely need to live, I'll need this back one to live behind the front one. It doesn't matter how many polygons I use to represent the back piece. If I use very fine polygons or very large polygons, it won't matter. Because, and now I'm going to have to skip to, to a picture here, which says, because of the way we've written down the energy, the energy of the function represented as constant inside this triangle, or constant set of parameters inside this triangle, is the same as the energy where uh, the triangle is split. Okay, so. The triangles never appear in the energy. The energy never gets to look at the triangles. It only looks at the function they define. So this is why I'm saying the size of the polygon can't matter. I'm talking about the polygon. I'm talking about your point spread function. Yes. Yes, absolutely. That must change. Yes, sorry. Oh, uh, Yes, I, I think you said polygon. Anyway, um, yes, the point spread function must change, but there are two ways to change it. The one we've done, which is hacky, is we've actually just changed it, but that doesn't cope with the fact that the points for function changes shape near the occlusions. The correct way to do it would be just to build a proper 3D model of the world and render so that and solve for that. Put in that extra single variable we have. We have, and I won't show you any pictures. Yeah, 
yeah, we have, and I won't show you any pictures because we can't recover it very stably yet. Uh, Kiros. Uh, two questions. Well, it seems like you may end up with lots of local labor because of the ambiguities in position of the universities. Absolutely. So, uh, um, the, the, the second part of the question is, because of all that motion, you may end up with weird mesh topologies mm -hmm. and yeah. Case, it looks ugly. Yeah, 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 it looks ugly. Okay, so uh, first of all, if you fix the triangulation, the solution for you um, under some norms is convex, under other norms is, you know, close enough that it doesn't matter. So, so if you can fix the mesh vertices, it's all fine. No local minima. Okay, but the whole point is to move the mesh vertices and do slightly better than you were doing with the fixed ones. The fixed ones is what we're doing. Right? And you have to do lots of hacks to get rotational invariance with the fixed uh, mesh. So what I'm saying is, it's a bit like, I hope Stefan agrees, that early fields of experts is simply, if you vary the experts, we're not saying we got the global optimum, we're not saying we learned the best, ex the best filters, but they were better than anything else because everything else had fixed filters. So what I'm saying is, start off with your mesh where you like it, right? as, as well as you like, start off your mesh where you like it. Now move it a bit and things will go better. Things will go better. By things will go better, I mean uh, PSNR will go up, or um, you know, super res super resolved image will look less ugly. So the fact that there are local minima does not mean so that, the fact that there are many minima around me does not mean I should stand high on the valley side. Right? I'm still going to do better by going down. Right. The question is, does the improve? Is the improvement worth it? Yeah. Yeah. That's the real question. Um, Rob and then. Um, uh, it turns out to be quite a difficult question to pose cleanly, right? So um, what does it mean to rotate the infinite image? I can rotate it by 90 degrees, but that's not very interesting. How, you know, how can I rotate it by 45 degrees? Well, I can trivially do it. I can apply a rotation matrix to the x's, to the 2D locations, but that's not an image you've ever seen. That's, just, that's like a rotated image. Um, if I rotate the image doing the appropriate resampling, well, you would first of all recover this representation, then appropriately resample, then, you know. Um. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, Andrew, the moving element there has been around since the late 80s. Yes. Associated with Miller. Um, even Miller, who you know, is kind of an enthusiast for it, doesn't claim that it's an infinite dimensional representation, which is. If the resolution not infinite dimensional, right? And I did say one sixty-four thousandth of a pixel, not infinite. Right, yeah. but you, you are still going to get your ring on the back, on the curved image back, simply because you can't get that big frame. Okay, so we're helped a little by the image, in that the image only exists at a certain resolution. So once you refine below what the image can tell you, your prior is completely in control, and you know doesn't need to cause ringing. It breaks down the old problem with unspooling images, which you get a little bit of ringing if your prior doesn't do it. Yeah, exactly. So the question is, does this prior intrinsically like or dislike ringing? OK. So well, hmm? is, is the news here that we should have known about the moving element method than we did? No, the news is that lots and lots of people know about the moving element method. They're frightened by it, because it looks like a hell of a lot of moving parts uh, to put together to make it work. Um, and the news here is that it's really important to move the vertices or the, the finite elements, to have your finite elements adapt. And I don't simply mean refine, right? Lots and lots of people refine. So I've got my triangles and I make everyone smaller by the same amount. Refining doesn't get you anywhere because it doesn't change the range of angles that you can represent. Right? So for my prior to be rotationally invariant, I need to be able to represent all angles, or all 64,000 squared possible angles that I can represent. So, so, yeah. Yes, but but um, I'm not claiming that this image recovers the underlying, the true underlying model, right? So, uh, yes, I could have a perfect. Uh, well, I mean, Okay, here's an example that will probably answer that question. So we've taken our um, rendered disk, computer graphics disk, and slide it slowly, 
Right? So the pixels just happen to be aligned differently with the disk and recovered. And you don't get the same disk, right? You get a little bit of wobbling and um, jiggling around at the boundary because, you know, the prior doesn't really know what's going on. It's not recovering the perfect disk. Um, so, yes, so if you did that graphics rotation, it depends where the pixels land, which answer you get. Um, do you really believe that now with this representation you can get away with the simple variation prior, or do you need more? That's, a real, that's the question, right? So, the textures isn't covered, modeled by its. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So, um, ooh, is that, when, was, when did you put that up? Okay, so let's make this the question session. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, you have some results to share. Oh, uh, results? Do you want results? Um, I'll, I'll do this one. Um, this is good because, okay, let me be clear. We've been working on this a long time. It turned out to be quite hard. We thought it was going to be quite hard, and it turned out to be quite hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, we are not even halfway done, right? Um, uh, what we want to do is solve an uh, optic flow program where yellow pixels map to purple pixels, <coughs> right? Because we hate yellow pixels mapping to purple pixels. Um, here's an intermediate um, result where uh, I have some input, some uh, denoising problems, and we have uh, techniques like BM3D uh, and ANAT's technique, um, which, you know, give us uh, reasonably nice looking images um, and PSNRs of these numbers. And we have our result, which gives us a PSNR which is not as good as these ones, but much higher than total variation, right? I do not think this result is properly converged, right? I don't think this result, I don't think the prior we're using, I think we should have a curvature-based prior, something more uh, Elastica-like uh, prior. Um, but yes, I hope that um, even, so with, clearly without texture it should be okay. Now think about texture. Uh, do I have some examples? Um, Texture, texture, texture. So we've looked a lot at uh, pixels with two or three pieces of hair in them. Okay, so there's individual strands of hair running through a pixel, certainly one strand of hair running through a pixel. At the infinite resolution, most of the, a lot of the textures one might think of should perhaps be correctly modeled as themselves, not as texture. Right? So uh, what I mean is, uh, you know, as, if you go close enough to my genes, you should start modeling it as white, blue, white, blue, white, blue. If you go far enough away, you should just model it as, you know, whatever, piecewise smooth um, variation from white to blue. So I do sometimes wonder, especially if you think about 5x5, five five, whether texture is just sort of a, an accident that says, looks too complicated to resolve, but we'll resolve it to something. David? So I have two comments. One is, it's extremely hard to tell which answer there is right. Yeah. It's just a question of which repulsive image effect you find more of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've read the caption to our uh, figure. Well, <laughs> What's reflecting on your remark about hair? Because it seems to me, out of this machine, if you were willing to work with enough triangles and big girls, you could be perhaps a very good man. Matter. matter, yes, we should. Yeah. We want to. Um, really well. Uh, some hair pictures of Fabio's thesis are pretty good. They're a bit fat. Right? I think if we made them too thin, we got a little bit of ringing. We don't know how to fix it yet. Um, yeah. But they're a little bit fat, maybe 20% too fat, but they really hair down the middle of the pixel. Yeah. Right. So, so I'll jump Thank in now. Yeah. Uh, I guess I guess we'll spend most of the time. So we'll eat a bit from the from the uh, uh, time from, from the coffee break, and I guess we could be like 35 or something, and then there's also more uh, lunch break. Make but thanks everyone.